Good morning. Just cleaning up the computer here for a second. Sorry about that. And good morning. Having a minor technical <laughs> difficulty here. I'll be started in a minute. And I apologize. Two seconds. All right. It looks like everything's running. We're get on I was a little bit delayed but this is the start of a public live series that I'll be doing every Thursday well at least three Thursdays a month there comes my dog in the background hey Willa you gotta lay down all right so let's get started more people will join as we get going so for 2023 I've been trying to plan out what I'm gonna be doing I've been doing impromptu live public videos I do know yeah, I now have a public membership tier, or I'm sorry, a private membership tier where I am more of a garden mentor. The classrooms are smaller. The chat rooms are smaller if that's something you're interested in. But Garden Grounds is going to be my Thursday public live. It's going to be three times a month, always at 11 a.m. It's going to be well-structured. I'm always going to have three topics, and I'm kind of, kind of going to do this just like a rusted garden video. I'll go over the topics. I will take some questions. If you have questions, um, I'll be taking the super chats with priority. But this is really about learning about the different topics. Today's episode is going to cover putting garden beds to rest and related chores. We're all in different zones, so everybody doesn't put their beds to rest for the winter. Um, could talk about how to select the right space to build your first garden, and then we'll talk about expanding gardens. And I think the garden grounds should go probably about 45 minutes. It is um, kind of a morning show, so to speak. Drink tea, drink coffee, kind of talk about what's going on in the gardening world, but also maybe start planning for the weekend that's coming up. So... I will start with a couple of questions because this is a new series. This is going to take place of my impromptu lives like today. This just kind of popped up. But I did put in episodes two and three um, into the really out there onto YouTube so you can see when they're scheduled. It's going to be the 10th and the 17th of this month at 11 a.m. Can't hear. How about can people hear it all now? I just need to check the microphones on everything's on on my end so if someone can just say hearing okay that would be great okay so putting your beds to rest that's really about letting your garden recover now i'm in, on the east coast and i'm going to get december january february march of really no growing so I highly recommend to give your, your beds a rest, give them a break. And in zones where you're going to have a winter and your beds stay, you know, unused, compost is always king or queen. Now, everybody doesn't have enough compost always or the room to make compost, but your garden is going to thrive off, off of organic matter. And it's really important that you find a local source, one that you can trust, or maybe start making it yourself. In the next, I think, um, Garden Grounds, we're gonna talk about composting. It just makes a huge difference. So what do I do? Now, if you have compost made or you have a source to it, I will just put down two, three, four inches of compost across my entire beds and let it sit. It's okay if it gets rained on. A lot of people worry that if you put compost out now, you let it rain, it's going to wash all the nutrients away. That's not true. What's really cool is your soil basically um, has positive negative charges and it will hold nutrients in there. So unless you're getting, you know, tons of rain and you have really sandy soil, your soil is fine. Just put the compost down. Worms will love it. They will dig through it over the winter, over those three or four months. They will um, aerate the soil, they'll lay, uh, not lay, but they'll excrete worm castings. It will be really perfect. Um, 
to get that soil refreshed, kind of like we do. Like we sleep, we feel hopefully a little better in the morning. If not, we need our coffee and stuff like that. So I know people are asking questions. This is a little bit different that I answer the questions more towards the end. So just hold them until you get to that point or until I get to that point. So that's what I like to do. Now, let's throw compost, compost out the window because you don't have it. The next step really is looking at your organic granular fertilizer. And I'll be talking about fertilizers in episode three of Gardening Grounds. And the organic granular is, you know, the stuff that's dry you pick up in your hand and you can kind of scatter it down. Now that's a slow release fertilizer, which means soil microbes have to break it down, sort of digest it to keep it simple. And then the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are in a form that the plants can pull it into their system when water is present. And that's what you want. The organic granular can take a while to um, break down. So it doesn't feed your plants immediately. So having that 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 120 days is perfect. If you don't have access to anything, just sprinkle you know, pretty heavily across the top of your soil, the organic granular, let it rain, that will get nutrients in there. And that may be all that you can do. Now, if you're able to get cut grass, um, bagged leaves, sometimes chopping the leaves up works really well. You can put fresh grass clippings and leaves on your beds that are going to be put to rest. They will break down Worms will get in there. Everything will kind of do its thing. It will give back to the soil. Now, it may not break down perfectly for spring planting. So you just slide it to the side. The bed got some nutrients. If you're going to plant seeds, you don't want to cover the seeds back up. So you got to kind of move it to the side, loosen that top couple inches of your soil, and you plant your seeds and do all that. We'll talk about that too in, in this series. If you're gonna do transplants, you can move the stuff to the side, put in your transplants and then move it back over. That will act as your mulch in the spring and in the summer, and it will continue to break down. It will conserve moisture. And it's just a good way to kind of get your bed started. So that's how you kind of put the beds to rest when you have two, three, four months of winter. And some of us have even longer periods. It's just, it's really a must. Over the 10, 11 years that I've been doing the YouTube videos, I probably relied more on fertilizers and didn't stress compost enough. I'll be doing that in 2023 pretty extensively to kind of reinforce the idea that if you feed the soil, you feed the plants, the plants are happier. And we're just following nature. And it saves you a lot of money. So that's generally for places that have winters. We'll talk about what happens if you don't really have a winter where you can kind of plant, you know, month after month after month. So let me see if there's any questions. Again, this is prim primarily going to be a presentation on my part. I will take a, t a couple of questions. If you are interested in doing a super chat, I will take them with priority. But when you say a question, type in bold question. I see that somebody did that. And in that same paragraph, go ahead and put in your question. So Sylvia says, I'm in North Carolina. Would it be good to lay cardboard on the ground? So cardboard can be used in a lot of ways. I mean, it can be used to start beds. Like I have a no dig garden where I just put down comp where I put down cardboard, two layers, put on six inches of compost and I planted right into it. You just put in your spade or your shovel, get in there, break the cardboard and I put in my transplants and it's been on its own for the last three years, I just add more compost. You can put cardboard if you're asking to put your beds to rest. Cardboard breaks down really easily. Use the brown cardboard just like this. It's fine if it has print on it, if it's flat. You just don't, I don't know what that real glossy, shiny print is made of, but usually the flat prints are okay. If you have plastic or tape on there, you do want to peel that off or you got to go back and peel it off. That won't hurt your garden, but it just doesn't break down. So if you're going to do that on your beds, and it's a great way to keep weeds out too, is put the cardboard down, but you want to keep it moist. If you just put cardboard down, it's going to dry and it's not going to break down. So on top of that, you could put soil from another bed. The cardboard will break down. You could put leaves or grass on top of it, but the cardboard can be a perfectly fine layer. And really in three months or so, that should be broken up and gone. And if it's not, just 
plant around it, 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 it will go away. And someone met, mentioned back to Eden's method. I mean, it's pretty, pretty similar. It's not complicated. Gardening, and one of the things I'm going to be doing for 2023 is really trying to simplif simplify gardening even further. We tend to get lost when we're new with everything that's commercialized and on shelves. We're very confused about what organic gardening is. This will be a future garden, uh, garden grounds too. Organic gardening is not using <laughs> organic fertilizers, the stamps, walking around trying to find that. It is in part. It's really about using what's local to you in your yard, in your community, other local resources and getting compost into the garden. That's organic gardening. Ways to manage pests and disease, maybe peppermint oil, soap, spray, mild stuff that's not going to harm you. It's really simple. We get a little too focused on everything has to be organic. The water's not organic. The water has chlorine in it. The um, fertilizers that you're using isn't 100% organic and it's not stamped. If you use a type fertilizer in your garden, you don't wreck anything. Organic gardening would be going back to maybe there's an emergency or maybe you can't afford fertilizers or you need something that is less expensive. Chemical fertilizers aren't going to wreck your garden. You go back to compost if you can. Anyway, getting a little bit ahead of the episodes. So the next thing is what if your beds don't get winters? What do you do? So this is really true for all of us. Come spring, maybe you missed putting down stuff for the fall for that winter slumber period and then maybe you don't have um a winter so what do you do it's a good idea to try and give each bed a rest of 30 days or so and put on new organic matter now that being said if you've got this beautiful compost that you've been making year after year and you have a ton of it you can just keep planting, just throw on fresh compost, you know, every three months or so and recharge your soil that way. And you can just keep going and going. A lot of times we don't have that. So come spring, if you have compost or maybe you've, you've been growing cool crops, now you're switching to summer crops or now you're going from the warm crops back to cool crops. You will still want to get down that couple layers of compost. Let your soil sit if you need to. That 30 days gives time for the compost to break down. And what do I mean by that? If it's yours, you know it's great, use it. But if you're buying bagged manures, bagged compost, compost from a landscaping company you don't know really well, anything can say compost and anything can be in transition of compost and you're decomposing. The words aren't the best choice. Your organic matter is always decomposing. Sometimes when you bag, when you buy bagged products, you're buying products that are still in that process of decomposing, yet they can call it compost. So if it's not fully broken down and you put it onto your garden and you mix it in and you put seeds in there, that bagged product or that compost that is not fully decomposed will be trying to take nitrogen from the surrounding area to decompose the organic matter. And that challenges your seedlings and your transplants. And that's why sometimes if you use the bag stuff, you have stunted transplants or you have seedlings that don't do much more than germinate because they use the seed coat for their food initially, but then they can't access nitrogen. And nitrogen is what's needed to get that green growth really going. So 30 days, if you throw down some bag manure or compost, it's not quite broken down. You're just letting it sit on the surface of the soil, maybe mix it in a little bit. That's up to you. In about four weeks, that will be breaking down more and you're going to have a better chance of not having that problem where your compost challenges your seedlings. Hopefully that makes sense. And again, I have uh, perk membership tiers and they are small. I'm going to have small classrooms, small uh, mentoring sessions where I can really answer your questions personally. And they, the sessions go an hour to an hour and 90 minutes. So I can, you know, just answer just about everything you need to help you out in your garden. These are going to be a little bit more of a presentation and, I'll, you know, we'll get to some of the questions. So we have compost that's ours, that's perfect, throw it on the beds whenever you really want to. No garden is going to reject fresh compost. 
come spring, if you're buying bag products or you need to rest your beds for a month, give them, or if you need to use bag products, give your beds about a month really for that to break down. The other trick that you can do in that 30 day period, and that's what's kind of important, is you can put down whatever the compost bag stuff you got. Then I would just take maybe fish emulsion. I am affiliated with AgroThrive. You can find that in the video description. Those are both organic fertilizers that have a good amount of nitrogen that's immediately available to the plant. Because it's immediately available to the plant, it's also immediately available to the microbes that are breaking down that organic matter. So you can kind of supercharge the compost that you put down that you're not quite sure about. That extra nitrogen will help speed up the process, help break it down, and it will also give an extra nitrogen in there so when you go to plant seeds or transplants, there's less competition. Just on the side note, if you ever buy the bag of compost, it's not the best, and you put your plants right in and they look like they're struggling, that's when you want to hit them every seven days with fish emulsion or agrothrive or any organic water-soluble fertilizer. The water solubles are immediately available to the plant and you're just putting in extra nitrogen and that might save you a headache. All right, any questions on that real quick? Um, so I, so if there's not a question, if the word question isn't in there, it's gonna be hard for me to see things. So Coco, um, can the trimmings from the evergreen type of bushes be put on the cold compost pile? Also, are grubs okay in a compost? You can put anything into a compost pile. So yes, with the evergreen types. And there's a little bit myth that they over acidify things. That's not really true. You're putting in so much different matter. You got rain, you got sometimes container soil you throw into your compost pile. Everything really balances out. If you're worried you're using too much of the pine needles, which are evergreens, but the needles do fall. Um, throw in some lime, but you don't really need to do that. Grubs are fine. There are certain grubs that are probably problematic, but there are so many different grubs that you'll drive yourself crazy. And in a pile, they're probably going to just mature and go away, or they're going to die off. But you know, until you have a problem with a specific grub, that when it matures, you know what it is, you really can't worry about it. A lot of beetles and whatever the insects start out as grubs and are hard to figure out. A lot of times they're Japanese uh, beetles. All right, so I saw another question. Yeah, all right, so it was environmental coffee house. Okay, a uh, question. What do you think of pig poop? My Amish neighbors use it and offered me some, but I didn't take it because I wasn't sure. So manures, I don't use often. If I do, you just want them to be fully composted down. The best animal manure is goat manure. And I'm not 100% sure, but I think they have like four stomach chambers. The more chambers the animal has, the more the food gets digested and broken down. So goat manure, you can almost use right away. Um, the pig manure, I would say there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, especially if they've been using it, but you do again want that to be composted down or you wanna use that, I would say in the winter when you have several months for it to kind of just break down with soil biology. Um, Rhett, who's also a Perks member, has a question. Do you still save wood ash or just use compost exclusively? So I have a video recently on putting the beds to rest. I keep my wood ash. Um, as long as it's wood, hardwood, softwood, like pine is a softwood, you can use that ash. It is, it is more alkaline, so it can raise the pH of, yeah, it can raise the pH of your soil, make it less acid, but it's only gonna be really about overusing that. So if you're just scattering down some of the uh, wood ash lightly in the spring or the end of the fall, you're not gonna hurt your garden. It's full of potassium. Thank you very much, um, Coco. And, oh, okay, I think I answered your question. If you have another question, throw it out there. Um, it's not gonna change your soil. That's sort of a myth. We get 
told a lot of times what not to do, but we don't get told why not to do it and how much not to do it. Meaning, if you're throwing piles of wood ash down, it's going to change. But if you're just using a little bit sprinkled across the top, it's not. So an, an experiment. If for some reason, if you know that your soil is high, a high pH, like seven, you probably don't want to add wood ash because it's going to start pushing it out of the range where plants grow. And plants grow in this big pH range of like five and a half to seven and a quarter or something like that. Um, but most of us don't do, do soil tests, and I actually only recommend them. We'll get to that, actually. I'll, well, let me say it because I'll forget. When we start talking about how to select a space, the only time, in my opinion, to get a soil, te a soil test for a home garden, my accent comes out, is when you're first putting the garden down because all the earth is the same. So you'll take samples from different areas, you'll send it out, and you'll get an idea of what your soil is made out of. Once your garden is up and going for years, like I have some beds that I put in compost, some beds that may get manure, some beds that some beds that might get both. And before you know it, your beds have various amounts of potassium, phosphorus, and other things in there. So you really would then have to start testing all your beds unless you do everything the same across your entire garden, if that makes sense. All right. Now I was saying something important and I forgot what I was saying. Oh, the soil test. So I did cover it. All right. So that's pretty much getting your beds a time to rest, either the long winter or, you know, 30 days in between plantings or maybe in the spring. If you don't have compost, you can put down in the spring the organic granular, just like I talked about, just sprinkle it across. Um, let it sit a little bit, but you can really start planting right away. If I mean, if you're not really putting down manures and you're putting down something that needs some time to break down, you can kind of wake your beds up and start planting. The organic granular is just nice to add light amounts across the whole surface, mix it in. That will slowly, like, slowly start breaking down. Once your plants are up and growing, if you get, you know, leaf mulch that maybe is not fully decomposed or compost that's not fully done. Once your transplants are in and the roots are down in the ground, putting stuff on top of the soil that's not fully broken down isn't going to reach into the roots and compete. It's when you mix that compost and manure into that top four inches when it's not fully broken down that it, it bothers your plants. So you could go ahead and then put down like leaves from whatever down or some grass that's not fully broken down. That's going to be your mulch. It will break down over the summer and spring. It'll give back to your plants. You can also put wood chips. I like the shredded hardwood. I don't actually, for some reason, I had it up here the other day. I don't have it now. But it's the it's double shredded or triple shredded. It's called different things in different places. But it's more strands than the big pieces of wood chips. The big pieces of wood chips just aren't going to break down. But if you get um, the shredded hardwood, use it as mulch. In a year's time, the worms and soil life really love it and break it down and incorporate that into the soil. So I like using that as a mulch. All right, so I think we covered putting beds to rest, some basic things. Related chores to that is really going around and trying to pull out, use a weed whacker if you don't have time. A lot of them are annuals. So if you cut them back, they're not gonna flower and seed and come back with a vengeance in the spring. So you wanna do a little bit of cleanup. You also wanna be looking around for um, you know, piles of maybe wood or bricks or clay pots or plastic containers that are all piled up. Snails and slugs are going to live in there. Um, moles and voles and um, mice can live in bags of peat moss, which can be problematic to the garden. So some of the winter chores is kind of lifting stuff off the ground or just making the space not really hospitable to snails, slugs, voles, moles, and mice. I think I covered that. Um, and it makes a difference. And that's basically the, the related chores. All right, let me buzz through for any more questions. Um, Vicky says, um, it's just in bold. Again, try put, put a question there. This is more of a statement, but it's interesting. Goat manure is mostly for green growth and not so much for fruiting plants. So compost, all things are called compost. 
Manures, when they're broken down, it's still compost. Leaf, leaves, sometimes they're called leaf mold. When they're broken down, it's still compost. But they do have different percentages of N, P, and K in there, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Goat manure may have more green or more nitrogen in there, so to speak. They wouldn't have green, but they eat a lot of greens. But they're eating all kinds of different stuff. So you still have potassium. You still have phosphorus. But the interesting thing with your question is, is a lot of times we're told plants need greens for green growth. True. I mean, need nitrogen for green growth. True. Plants need potassium and phosphorus for fruiting and flowering. True. But what we get sold on is thinking that we have to have these percentages that are so precise that it really matters to the plant. When I talk about um, fertilizer, and I think in episode three of uh, Garden Grounds, those little differences between a 533 and a 422 and a 643 are so subtle, it doesn't matter because that product breaks down at a different speed in your garden bed. You have different elements already in your garden bed. You're not really influencing fruiting or anything like that. Nitrogen is the most used. So and it gets used up quick. It doesn't stay in the soil well. Phosphorus and potassium does. So we need to use like fish emulsion or agrothrive or water soluble sometimes to get more leafy green growth. But with manures, you can just consider giving your bed, you know, what it needs. With compost, if it's leaves um, or grass and organic matter, you know, waste plants from the garden, you just treat it as it's giving your plants N, P, and K. Just a fun note is compost. Um, is really well below a 111 NP and K. I mean, really well below that. But it's that consistent presence in the top six inches of your soil that your plants get everything it needs. So we don't have to depend so much on is it a 533 or a 423 fertilizer or a 651 fertilizer. You can, I mean, if you enjoy it, but just as a new gardener, you don't have to overstress. And by, you know, <laughs> for goodness sake, don't buy. Pepper fertilizer, tomato fertilizer, leafy green fertilizer, heirloom tomato fertilizer, garden fertilizer, blooming for you just don't need that. You know, if you want to do that, that's fine, but it's not going to make much difference. Just pick one that's on sale and go ahead and use that. Um, question, can you put dead tomato plants in your compost pile? I do. Um, we'll talk more about that down the line. If you feel your plants have a disease on them and you don't want to risk it, don't put them in there. I just put everything into there because these diseases show up. They're around. They're overwintering on host plants. They float in the air. Um, you know, it's a concern that I think is overblown. You didn't, you didn't initially infect your plants. So where did it come from? All right, let's go to part two. How to select the space um, for and build your first garden. So I am very thankful that you guys have hung around for years with me and that I've had a YouTube for 12 years. So you probably all know in January, I kind of start from the beginning and I go all the way through. So some of you have heard this stuff before. With the live videos, I'm trying to change it up a little bit. I'm trying to make newer videos that have information for uh, seasoned gardeners, but I'm always focused on the new gardener. So chat is a great way to meet people in your local growing area. Um, and I know that the people in here are wonderful. Um, most gardeners are, if not all of us. But make friends, chat, talk, and, you know, find friends where um, they grow in a similar zone to you. And if you're a new gardener, you can get a lot of experience from them. So the brand new gardener. And, you know, maybe you've been gardening for a while. And as I've done in the past years, decades ago, you put the garden in the wrong place. You walk out when it's winter. Spring is coming, all the leaves are off the trees, and you're like, okay, I'm going to put my garden here. And before you know it, the leaves are on the trees, and now you have too much shade where you dug. You don't want to dig an entire garden, set it up in any time, really, but set it up and then find you have to move it. So it's really worth, let me just do a time check. All right, we got about 15 minutes. So it's really worth walking out at 8 a.m. 10 a.m., 12 p.m., 2 p.m., and 4 p.m., right where you want to have the garden, and just make a check on a piece of paper, take some notes, that the sun is coming and hitting that space. If you have trees, 
you have to sort of look to see where the shadows are falling and they're going to just be branches, of course. But imagine the leaves on there and we'll be covering the bed. You always want to try and get a bed that's eight hours. Eight hours of sun lets you grow mostly everything. You can grow plants with less sun, but it can become a problem. You also want to locate that bed where you have years to keep it there and trees aren't going to grow up tall and then cast shadows onto it. So it does take a little bit of work and a little bit of planning. The sunlight is the biggest deal. You know, if you want to do that soil, soil test, you can go ahead and do that. Um, but if you have grass, weeds and stuff growing there, the so soil, I don't know why I can't say that. The soil is going to be fine for your first year and you don't need perfect soil. Um, well, let me get to that in a second and I'll make a note here. Perfect soil. The next thing you want to look at is water runoff. That's hard to judge, but after a hard rain, if your water is pooling where the garden's going to be and it sits there for a half a day, that's probably too much water. Nine out of 10 times drainage is not an issue, but you do want to watch how water runs, especially in suburban neighborhoods. Sometimes the land is set up that when it rains, all this water comes from neighbors' properties and it could run right across where you want your garden to be. The water will drain quickly, but it can wash a lot of your soil away and damage your plants. So it's not that the soil is uh, staying soggy, it's that you have this big runoff when big storms come and it can just literally wash your garden away. Let's see what uh, Stacy has question. And I appreciate you being a member too. Are clear plastic domes and your, and your window well dome good for winter protection? Th they are, it depends on how you wanna use them. Like, and a lot of people don't have window wells. It depends on where your home is and what your temperatures are. But I make, so if on the ground floor, I'll have a lower window, I have a basement and you can put a clear dome over that and protect water and from so the water and stuff doesn't fall in, fall into the window well but they're like these half circles so i've made um domes out of them by just pinching two half circles together i drop it over my plants and you can sometimes extend the season or you can start earlier with it so yes you can use them in that way now when winter comes and the cold really rolls in, if there's not a heat source, even with the dome, the ground is still going to freeze. The temperatures are still going to get too cold. So they're more temporary. Um, somebody said, how much do uh, cherry tomatoes need? Cherry to any plant will grow with less sun. They're just not going to produce well. So cherry tomatoes are pretty prolific. They might get by just fine with six hours of sun. Um, that's one of the plants that, you know, may be okay. It also depends. So when you're doing your garden, if you get sun, let's just say from seven to 11, that's only four hours. And then maybe some in the afternoon that could total up to six or eight hours. You want to get to that eight hours. If you have a place where it gets shade in the morning, but maybe you get sun 12 p.m. to 5 p.m. That five hours is really intense sun, and that's better than a morning sun. It gets confusing. But as the day progresses and the sun gets up higher, it's more intense. It helps your plants better. But please, if you can, stick with eight hours. And that eight hours could be three or four hours in the morning. It could be four or five hours in the afternoon because your sun may track around. There might be a tree right there but it can be mixed sun. It doesn't have to be eight continuous hours. It can be throughout that, that period of time. <laughs> that period of time is daylight. Okay, um, let's see. Perfect soil. So you pick your bed, you're getting your uh, garden ready. You do all that kind of stuff. We'll talk about garden designs too in future episodes. You don't need perfect soil right away. You just need decent stuff. That's when we can use the organic granular fertilizers to help the plants out. If you wanted to use the chemical fertilizers, you could. You can use water-soluble fish emulsion, which is organic. That helps get the plants growing. If you can get compost in, that's fine. What I recommend is when you, before you even break ground, build a compost bin, bin if you have the space. We'll talk about the build design future episode. But it's basically four feet by four feet. You just pile all the leaves in now and you get your compost going. Over the years, 
two, three, four years, you'll develop better and better garden soil and your garden will be happy for it. But don't feel the pressure that you need perfect soil to start. You just don't. And that becomes a barrier for a lot of people. And they spend a lot of money. Buying bagged soil products is so expensive. Um, just a tip is look locally at landscape companies. You can go and inspect their product. Get a load of compost or garden soil. It's not going to be any worse than what you buy in a bag. Um, and you can amend that. So you can use more of that organic granular as you're kind of blending that together and put it into your bed. It's just, it's just a way to save money. All right. Those are the main things. It's sunlight placement, shade. Don't overstress about perfect soil and pay attention to how rushing water whips across your garden. Not so much sitting. If you have sitting water and it's a problem, you're going to have to build raised beds and that will raise the soil level, give better drainage. We'll talk about that in the future. All right. So typically these are going to be about 45 minutes, but of course I like talking about vegetable gardening. Let's see. Quick questions. Um, environmental coffee house. Did you have a drought this year? Do you have supplemental water like runoff and rain? So Marilyn, I'm very lucky. We rarely have droughts. And if we do, it might be a 10 day period. So yes, we did, but they last about 10 days. Um, I water with a hose. I have well water. It's um, really not an issue. Hold on. It's really not a here. It's really not an issue here in Maryland. Um, I may set up a water collection system over at my garage, and that's only because the hose doesn't reach over there, and I have a lot of perennial plants. So I'm going to try and collect water there so that I can just use that to water around there. But we rarely have restrictions and we rarely have a problem. You know, sadly, for the, I'm really worried about California, and I'm worried about the water and the cost through all the different states to grow food now. I mean, it's just crazy. I might be doing a video on it. Um, but it's making me nervous that farmers are going to be in trouble, that when food prices go up, farmers are going to be focused on as gouging and stuff like that. People don't understand how hard it is to make a profit on a farm. And they don't understand that growing food isn't easy. It's not overly difficult, but it takes a lot of time. So anyway, I'm worried about California to answer your question, but we just we don't get a, you know, any um, significant drought here compared to the rest of the United States, knock on wood. Yeah, so environmental saying their drought was for two months. And, you know, you're dealing with a couple of wells, how to collect water. Um, and it's hard to collect enough rainwater to get you through two months of drought because where are you going to store it? So... You need to have consistent rain. So I'm, I'm worried too for you. Um, country living question. We use chicken manure sparingly as a fertilizer in our gardens, but have been told not to use much of it at all. It's mixed with bedding. Any thoughts? So that, I don't know why. I mean, if they're telling you not to use a lot, Maybe fresh because it's still going to break down. People worry about salmonella from chicken and stuff like that. But the beddings, the manures, the urine, that's all good stuff. Throw it into a pile. Let it break down. And once it's composted and broken down, you can use as much as you want. Um, again, that's another term. Like, what do they mean by much? You know, eight inches is probably too much. Two inches on the soil is probably fine. So sometimes when people tell you things, you want to find out what do they mean by that what is too much and stuff like that but composted chicken manure is really good to use all right so let's get to the last part so expanding gardens fall here in maryland or anytime really um you can expand your garden and we'll be talking about maybe episode two we'll be talking about trellising vertical gardening and this is kind of you know segue into that next episode. Trellising is a great way to gain additional space to your garden. So when you think about expanding your garden, you don't need to expand, what is that, horizontally? <laughs> 
and just put out more and more beds. If you got a ton of land, that's fine. You can also expand vertically and set up different trellising for beans, for peas. I grow um, butternut squash up that. You can grow melons up that, light, lighter weighing melons you can. You can uh, even raise more of your vining squash and zucchini up them so that the space is going upward. You have more ground space so you can plant in more things. You can also use the vertical trellising. Like, let's just say your bed's right here, your trellis is right here, and the sun is over here. If you grow beans up this trellis, you're going to have shade to cast down onto here. And it's not going to be shade, you know, that blocks the whole eight hours. But that shade will keep the ground cooler. And very often, that cooler ground will allow your tomatoes, your uh, peppers to thrive because they will shut down in the high heat of summer when that soil temperature gets too high. They'll drop flowers, they'll drop fruit. With that shade coming down and hitting air, you can extend the growing period for your cool weather crops like lettuces and spinach and radishes so that that warmth of the soil doesn't get them to the point where they bolt and flower and just aren't tasty. So you can kind of expand your garden if you wanna start thinking about growing vertically where you would place them and how much more space you would get. And it's, you know, and certainly I didn't say, but I grow all my cucumbers vertically. You know, you can always squeeze vertical growing in somewhere. Just check your bed and, you know, the sun may go this way. And when the sun is up here, that's where the main shadows are gonna be. So if this is your growing bed and you put a trellis here, shadow is gonna cast onto your growing area. If you want that, that's fine. If not, put it over here. So the bed right here gets the full afternoon sun and then the shadow casts away from that bed, maybe into your walking path or something like that. So there's a little bit of strategy to how you use trellis, uh, trellises. All right, so I think I'm done with uh, gardening grounds. Why am I calling this garden grounds? It's so new. I forgot the name. I think we're going with garden grounds, but I'll figure that out in episodes two and three. But it will be live. It will be scheduled every Thursday, 11 a.m., at least three times a month. We'll have three topics. I will answer some questions. If you're interested in having more of a garden mentor, please consider the membership perks. We I do three Q&As really about mentoring where people ask anything about what's going on in their garden. I might have a light topic, not as detailed as this. Also be doing a classroom series. We're going to be doing um, seed starting as part of that too. These are all plants I'm growing indoors real quick. Uh, arugula, radishes, peas. This is all for me to be able to actually grow under white LEDs and have some food coming out of my grow light station right over there. Thanks so much for watching and I will see you guys next episode.